you get in the submarine and you go through the sunlit part of the ocean, beautiful colors, it's very transparent on the surface. You see the fish, the jellyfish, um, and then you start to sink down and the color changes. You go through this amazing palette of blues until finally you're in the black in about 500 meters. It happens very quickly. And then as you make a bottom approach, the pilot will turn on the lights, slow the vehicle down, adjust the buoyancy. And then the last 100 meters, you're driving down and just staring through the viewports, trying to see that, that C4 first show up. It's, it's a very exciting thing. It's, you know, it's, it's always exploration. You never know what you're going to land on, what you're going to see. It's black, often glossy, gla glassy black basalt. And very, um, looks like motion frozen. So the lava has erupted and then it's just kind of locked in place as it set, as it chilled. Uh, sometimes there are drain back features, there's crevasses, there's, when we're in the spreading center, we can often go into fissures that are literally where the great ocean plates are spreading apart. It's like being rent apart, ripped apart. In this region, in, in, in Fiji, in Tonga, uh, Papua New Guinea region, the hot springs are colonized by snails, large snails. So golf ball size snails, um, several different species, and they're, um, they're black or white, they're surrounded by mussels and barnacles. The barnacles have really delicate little cirri that come out to feed. There's a lot of activity, it's very, very um, rich in life, really amazing place. You can't eat the animals that live, live at these hot springs, but they are um, they're scientifically incredibly interesting. They give us clues about um, adaptations to extreme environments. They often have physiological systems, biochemical systems that are designed, adapted, exquisitely adapted to some very unusual chemical conditions, lots of heavy metals. That's not normal for an animal to be able to tolerate that. So we can look into those animals, kind of do our biological sleuthing, and figure out how they make a living, how they survive in such a, what seems like a noxious environment. The extremes we see at the hydrothermal vents, the hot springs, they're, they're kind of, they're, they serve as analogs for what environments might be like on other planets, especially these other planets that have oceans or the, or the moons, so like uh, Europa, the moon of Jupiter. So if you have hot springs in that ocean with particular chemistry, you know, we, can, we can look for that same kind of chemistry in the analog in our own planet down deep on the seafloor. And these, are, these kinds of systems are giving us clues to the potential for life on other planets and also how life might have originated on our own planet. So as a, as a scientist, we're really interested in understanding those adaptations um, and also understanding the impact of mining. So if you remove those populations, will they come back? How, we're pretty sure they will come back, but how fast will they come back? How much will the fluid chemistry that they depend on be modified? Will it have to change over time? Will it, will it become something different and then have to come back to what the animals can tolerate? Um, can we facilitate that kind of recovery of the system? So we've been uh, working with industry to collect baseline data from these sites against which we can compare the recovery time. So I think, um, I think we have a chance to really understand, in instead of just talking theoretically about what the impacts might be if this mining event takes place, or when it takes place, we'll be able to monitor afterwards and compare against this baseline we've already collected. Yeah, I think there's a, a real opportunity to think about the spacing of the vents or the, or the prospects where mining might take place and making sure that there's, um, that we can avoid cumulative impacts, that we can understand where we need broodstock, where we can leave, where we must leave communities alone so that we can repopulate the, the damaged sites. So there's opportunity for those larvae to move from one site to the next. So um, cumulative impacts, make, making sure that an entire basin isn't completely mined uh, in terms of environmental management would be a very wise thing. So setting up reserve areas that are untouched, monitoring them as well as the recovery of the mined area is important. Um, we need to understand some of the natural dynamics even. We don't know how fast, uh, following a natural disturbance, some of these sites would recover. Uh, so there's a lot to learn. I like to think of SWAR1 as a, as a test mine. I, I know it's, it's not how the industry thinks of it, but if, if, it, if it goes 
if, if it recovers very quickly, you know, then, then there's the possibility of adapting the strategy, the environmental management plan, and moving to other sites quickly. Um, but if it takes a long time to recover, then I would hope that the adaptive management strategy kicks in and we say, well, wait a second, you know, we've got to catch our breath and find out why it didn't recover. These hydrothermal vents, the hot springs, also have, have values beyond the mineral resources. They have, obviously, the scientific value. Um, they have genetic resources that could eventually become valuable. Uh, they're, they're beautiful. Um, the ordinary citizen isn't going to see them day to day or, or maybe ever in their lives, but they can see pictures and appreciate that this is a system very different from what we see on land, uh, that it's dependent on chemical energy rather than sunlight. Um, that it's really a living library for us, for, for the people of the Pacific Island nations to build the capacity to go, go study these sites and really understand what's there and, and, the, and the value of those systems to the island nations. There are some uh, enzymes that are very uh, valuable that have, that have been developed from hydrothermal vents from, uh, that are used in the molecular biology and in medicine and science, scientific research for molecular studies. Uh, there are cosmetics that are <laughs> derived from deep sea hot spring microbes. Uh, so there's, and there's, there's also potential for therapeutic agents, the anti-cancer, anti-disease anti, um, kinds of uh, agents from the, from the genetic resources. So all these different species that are adapted to different kinds of interactions than what you see on land. So the animals that live there are not tied to food webs up on the surface. Um, in fact, the, the productivity at these hot springs really is very local. It stays in that area. It seems to be recycled quite close within that vent community uh, and is not exported out. So it's hard for me to imagine a link between the seafloor biology and the surface biology and an impact on, on fisheries or shark, shark calling, the kinds of things that might be happening on the surface. I would love to see a map of where all the sites are in the activity, the active fence sites and you know habitat mapping. And if they are all over the place, then for sure we can go in, and save some, and extract minerals from others. Um, that's the kind of that's what environmental baselines are all about: is where are the habitats, how are they connected, how many are there, and how fragile are they, or how susceptible are they to damage. And the hot springs are some of the most resilient systems in the deep sea, so. Um, it may be possible to extract things, extract minerals from them, and they'll come back right away. But we don't know that. So we, we just need to know a lot more.